Okay, our next talk is by Alan Neeson, and he's going to talk about switch deb ho hardware offload optimizations. Uh, so please give him a warm welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, just a few words on, on who I am before we start diving into this, because it may affect how I see things and, and how we should proceed from here. So I'm a software engineer at Microchip located in Copenhagen. I've been working at all these VSC parts that are written from Vitess for roughly the past seven years. And in this audience, I need to say I'm much more knowledgeable about network technology in general than I am in, in, the, in the deep and, and uh, core implementation of, of SwitchDev and DSA and, and, and the general kernel upstream development. But we are learning a lot and, and, and we're getting a lot of support from the community, so I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about this. Um, I've been deeply involved in, in the upstreaming efforts and, and, and how Microchip should, should approach this and, 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 and making many of the decisions about uh, really pushing that we need to go for an upstream implementation because we believe it's a nightmare to maintain out of three and so on. So, so that's also another aspect of my work where it's taking a good amount of time. <laughs> so just to be clear for everybody, this is not really a presentation on what we have achieved. This is a presentation of lots of problems we have uh, run into and, and, and something we're working on, something we want to achieve. Hopefully there will come another opportunity where we can present all the, the results, but, but this is not what this is. So, so any idea, solution, example here shouldn't be used or counted on. They will probably change many times before, before this hint something uh, that is useful for, for anybody outside my microchip. So, so just to be clear. So, I want to talk about switch default optimization because this is where I spend my time, this is where I'm facing a lot of issues, but in order to do this in a meaningful way, we kind of need to introduce what kind of hardware am I working on, what kind of use cases are we interested in, because without this context, it's pretty hard to, to, to make some good adjustments and so on. So, this is probably what I will be spending, I don't know, half of the time on explaining these use cases and so on, and the remaining half time will be kind of what are the, the problems we have seen and, and, and what are the discussions, our understanding about it, and, and hopefully um, we will get something useful, good discussions out of this. So, so we kind of want to explain the use cases as we see them, but we also very much want to understand how you see them and, and in order to be able to proceed with, with this work. So the hardware I'll be considering in, in this talk um, Microchip certainly have hardware in, in, in this uh, range, but, but it's not microchip specific. So, so it's, it's simple switches with very low port counts. Many of them have only two ports and then an integrated CPU. It can forward traffic to and from. Um, the CPU is typically really small, it has, but it do have DMA channels in order for doing frame I.O. And often the CPU is not really here to serve the switch. It's assumed to do its work on its own. The CPU is here in order to serve the I.O. which is in the other end. So, it's for deeply embedded systems where it's kind of the main controller for this device. It may be a sensor, it may be controlling something, I don't know. It's not really important for it. The important thing here is that we cannot really expect the CPU to spend a huge amount of its time doing the bridging. This is what kind of why we're interested in, in doing the offload. Um, so, and typically also it, it either have an integrated CPU or it supports external CPUs via PCI Express. Um, and often we want to have some kind of redundancy here, either the FREA or the CB standards, DLR, MRP. Uh, I may get to this as the last thing in the talk. Let's see how, how times are flying. Um, but, but this is kind of, um, of the important properties of the hardware I want to discuss. The hardware can do a tons of other things, at least the hardware I'm working on, but, but this is uh, to set the scope of, of this presentation. <clears throat> so with this hardware, um, it's important to, to understand um, how it's expected to be used. And, and what we see in many cases is that um, due to the cost of wiring, there is a significant interest in order to build these <coughs> data chains where you simply take a bunch of devices, you data sync them together, and then you expect that the switch can pick up the frames the CPU is interested in in order to get the needed network connectivity and in order to work. And because of, of, um, of this change of uh, devices, the latency becomes quite important. 
So there can be maybe 100 devices chained together, meaning that the latency is times 100. Um, um, another good thing to understand here is, and, and, and that's kind of how marketing sees this, so, so they have these devices, and, and there's a switch on it. This happens to be where I'm working, but they are promoting those as host devices. So all the use cases are kind of seen as if the switch was a host, because um, this is the application they go into. They are not fulfilling a job of a big switch that sits on the top of a rack. They are actually fulfilling a job of, of some kind of host node that sits somewhere in your network and in some machine. Um, and that's actually quite important to understand. And after I did the slides, I realized maybe I should have picked a better title, something like connecting host via bridges or something else, because this is actually what is dominating uh, many of the problems and, and how, we are, how we are defining these problems we want to, to solve. Um, yeah, and the CPU is busy uh, solving other issues that I had said already. Another um, very much expected use cases to build these rings because when you start to chain a huge amount of nodes together, it becomes very vulnerable to, to some um, cable cuts or what do I know. So there's a, it's pretty common in, in, in these networks to, to create rings uh, that may be going through some gateway node that can connect the ring to, to other rings and so on. And in classic Ethernet, this is a pretty bad idea because you would have a loop on, on the network clearly, but that's kind of why I, I highlighted these redundancy features. So, so something, assuming we, we get the bulk of these issues fixed, then it's kind of the next step as we see it. We want to, to work on some um, MRP and DLR, which are ring protection protocols, which are really important this, in this domain, and, and which we also see some good opportunity to do hardware offloading of, because they are doing a lot of repeated work again and again and again, something hardware is pretty good at, and then we want to, to put all the state machines and so in the Linux kernel. Um, so this is kind of, of the domain we are working in, at least with this specific. So we, are, we do have other products and in other domains, but, but this is what I want to talk about here. So of course, as always, please interrupt if you have any questions about this. So let's try to discuss some of the um, offload optimization that can be done here. And, and in order to have kind of a, a good reference to say, okay, what, what can we do uh, if we choose not to go the Linux way, if we have some existing setup, which are often seen, uh, where you kind of have these three port switches that, that they exist uh, a large number of, and you have some proprietary software setting up the switch, you have your classic Linux SOC connected via NIC to the CPU, and the CPU drives the I.O. That, that will kind of be my reference, would say, what, what, what are people doing today? Because these are not new problems. People have been doing this for a long time. New standards is coming along to, to make it more attractive, but, but kind of to have some existing reference that is not supposed to be discussable. So, so, um, and, and then we want to pretty much achieve the same use cases with, with comparable performance. Of course, it does not need to be one-to-one. -one. We just want whatever worked before should still be working. Um, and, and, and with this model, we'll be considering the hardware I introduced, where we'll be having a two-ported switch. It, it will have a DMA being able to transfer frames to the CPU. It can, of course, do offloading forwarding frames from, from the two ports. It has, a, even though it's only two ports, it's not this EtherCAD system. It, it does have a complete queuing system, meaning that you can inject frames from the CPU and then it, it take the priority into account and all of this. So, so it is actually real uh, bridging. It, it's not uh, cheating. Uh, and there could easily be four ports. It wouldn't change kind of the big picture here. Um, and the key things I will be looking at uh, in terms of performance is the number of frames being copied to the CPU because typically the I.O. between the switch core and the CPU is pretty low, so, so we do have a significant limit about what, what we can do. And also, each frame going to the CPU ends up being processed, and if it was not needed in the first case, we would rather not have it there. Of course, it does not be, need to be a binary comparison, so it just needs to be reasonable. So this is what I will be comparing it to, and some of the optimization does a big difference. Some of them does a little difference. I try to order them <laughs> so that we look at the big difference first, and then the 
the later we get into the presentation, the less important it will probably be. Um, so, another terminology, I was not sure what it was called, so just to be sure we mean the same thing, so I often refer to part in interfaces, and when doing that, I, I mean when you enslave an interface to a bridge that comes from something else than the switch step driver. So, so this is what I refer to as foreign interfaces. It's not, so this is a central piece of, of how the, the bridge core is working and, and it's, it's pretty nice. It, it, it can do some really cool things, but there are a few optimizations that become a lot harder when having these foreign interfaces. So I try to, to highlight when can this be supported and when can it not because it may affect how things need to be done and it also may affect if it should be done. Um, because I, as I see it, it's a pretty cool feature, something that, that, that we would actually like to be able to, to use more and more. But if the downside is that we cannot enable the use case, then it's probably also something where we want to at least be able to sub-optimize the cases where we happen to not have any front end interfaces. And, and that is probably the, the, the the case in most of these scenarios that I have been listing, then the bridge will probably be forwarding between the two interfaces that have. Um, and it is something that, that you can actually check for today. So, so uh, several of, of the existing implementation do not allow these current interfaces to be enslaved to a switch when, when they are there. So, so it's not a new concept. So um, for people who have followed the net next, we, we, we caused a bit a bit of a noise there. Um, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, so today, when, when an interface is enslaved to... Uh, so now I'll go into explaining um, a bunch of very specific use cases we want to optimize, how, how we can see it happening, and, and, and what it will mean to do. And the proposed mode will be the first one I will be discussing. So, um, <clears throat> so today, when an interface is being enslaved to a bridge, the interface is set to promiscuous mode. Um, and when I was reading the code, I said, mm, this makes a lot of sense because this code was probably written before we had switched over DSA. So, so that kind of makes a lot of sense if you want to do bridging across a bunch of NICs. You kind of need the packets to go to the CPU for the CPU to, to take a forwarding decision. And we were thinking, okay, so there are some optimization. If you happen to not want to do flooding, not want to do learning, then you don't need it. This didn't really help us. And, and we're thinking the, the hardware we are working on and, and probably most of the hardware that exists in the DSA and, and, and uh, switch the world can actually do the flooding and learning on their own. So we thought, hmm, this would be a good candidate to start with because it, to us it seemed obvious that, that you, you may want not need to put these interfaces into promiscuous mode. Um, and we didn't really foresee this big discussion there was on it. And apparently there were kind of two things. Uh, the one discussion was that there were very different understanding about what does promiscuous mode mean. Um, so some people had the view, it means every frame on the wire should go to the CPU. Others saw it as it means that uh, you should disable all RX filtering, meaning that offloaded traffic should never go to the CPU. <coughs> I will not go into to, to this discussion here. It has been well discussed at the mailing list, but it, it's good to have in mind. Um, I am going to make a quick statement because this topic got brought up. <laughs> Please do. Um, it is clear that the bridge is trying to achieve a certain objective. And when the user fires up TCP dump, they're trying to achieve a certain objective. And they're different. In the, so it, it kind of seems to suggest that the fact that we've shared this pr promiscuous operation with the bridge was, is illogical because it's something else. There should be a back call that says, not put the interface in permissive snow, but we're putting this bridge that you're a part of into learning and flooding mode. Do whatever is appropriate for your device to achieve this objective. Yeah. And I then agree. we can solve the quote unquote permissive mode problem in the other space that that exists. And I think that's how we should move forward for the record. I agree. And, and also, so, so our intent here was actually, we want it to be easy to debug. We, we want it to be able to write TCP dump like we always do. And, and, and that was kind of 
a clear objective. And, and there is a really easy workaround if, if you wanted to avoid this discussion. And that is, do not implement promiscuous mode. Because, yeah, the kernel sync is in promiscuous mode, but if it's not implemented, hmm. So, so um, and, and this is actually what was done in, in the Ocelot device, where we ran into this issue, but we really didn't have the energy to, to try to do anything about it. So, so, so we, we found, hmm. yeah, it works, but it would really be nice to have this debug feature. Um, so clearly, we, after discussing it at the mailing list, there has been a lot of uh, attempt to actually try to do this and, and keep the changes in the driver. Unfortunately, we haven't found a way to do that. So, so if this is something we, we want to, to get solved, then at least based on the experiments we have done so far, we, we pretty much believe that we need to do um, some changes in, in the corporate implementation in order to achieve this. Luckily, we can still can, can, support... Can you clarify what you exactly mean by a foreign interface? These are, these are net devs that are not in any way part of the switch dev device. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in the situation where you have this sophisticated device that can learn and flood on its own, this promiscuous mode request from the bridging layer, you would not put a promiscuous mode for the switch dev device, but that ETH0, ETH1 guys may yeah. really do promiscuous mode and learn through the yes. software switch. Yes. Okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot that, of sense. That is what we need. Um, and, and it may be a physical device, but it could also be a tunnel, as far as I understand. So we could be bridging in and out of an Ethernet software. tunnel. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a nice way of testing it when you happen to have an SOC that only has non ferritin devices and we create a tunnel in order to see does it actually do something meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these are kind of the challenges that, so the first two, we need to overcome this if, if we want it to work, at least that is my point of view, we need to find something that everybody can agree on if we want this functionality to work. I would very much like it to work, but it is a debug feature, so it's not the most important topic on, on my agenda. So another interesting outcome out of, of playing around with this was actually, and, I, and it was also mentioned at the mailing list, is that the bridge code generates some, some events when new uh, MAC addresses are being learned. And naturally, in order to, to keep these events flowing, we need uh, some way of, some other channel of information to get this from the hardware. So, so it's actually something that is being implemented in, in the next uh, tips we are doing where we will be uh, getting an interrupt from the MAC table such that we can iterate over newly learned MAC entries and, and, and feed these uh, events back to the, to the bridge core such that we will get it. And, and I, I saw that Mellanox actually have the same functionality in their SOC, so I'm not 100% sure how it works, but, but, but that is certainly something that is needed in order to get to the same table. And it would be really nice to have these events. Uh, another mechanism could be to do polling then you can also learn if something new. <laughs> so uh, the kernel already has support for it. I mean, the switch dev driver and the Mellanox driver already supports learning from hardware, yep. learning from Macs. So are you suggesting here the kernel, if uh, the kernel needs more support or are you suggesting your hardware needs? No, I'm okay. suggesting my driver needs it. Driver needs it. So, so okay. it, it's, it's pretty much an, an observation. So people who want to take advantage of, of not putting interfaces into promiscuous mode need to be aware that then you need to provide these learning events. And if your driver do not do this work, then they will not be there. Okay. And it will be a difference. So, so it's, just, um, it's just to highlight that you need to remember this, otherwise they, they will be missing. And, and, and you may not want that. So honestly, it's always kind of felt weird to me that a bridge device has this one interface that is kind of special, which is the name of the bridge device. It's always felt to me like the, the interface that you put into the bridge should be kind of the same sort of slave as all the physical interfaces you put into it, and that you could have multiple virtual slaves that you put into the bridge. The, and then the if you were to enable promiscuity on those slave interfaces, you would just see what the bridge is delivering to those interfaces. But if you were to enable promiscuity on the actual bridge interface, you'd kind of see the actual behavior of the entire bridge. It's a side effect of history, right? Right. The, we were in the Stone Ages, everything was a networking device. So if we needed a control object for a higher level representation of a group of devices, we would just make another net device for that. It's bonding, bridging, everything, so. I actually think it's a, it makes a lot of sense to me. 
you, you have the bridge device, which represents a layer two broadcast domain, while you have the physical interface that represents a physical domain. So if you want to inject a packet, you want to be flooded or, or forward according to learning, you need to do that the bridge device. If you want to do some LLDP and link specific stuff, you should do it at, at link device, at least that is how I'm seeing it. Well, my, my conceptually, my view of it is that you have a virtual interface with a virtual link into the bridge, and then that bridge has physical links out of the box for the physical network ports, and that you you almost want to kind of like think of that entire bridge device as sitting in a separate namespace and kind of not bothering you. Um, But there is times when you need to see the details, for example, IGMP snooping, or PTP when you need to send it out a specific interface and not the bridge interface. So yes, it's nasty having this bridge, as a, this bridge interface as being something different. I would really like to see it nicely modeled as just another port. Right, right, but that's precisely the problem right now, that you can't, you can't differentiate traffic that's coming in and out of the bridge that is the kernel's bridge interface, the stack's bridge interface, versus the bridge as a whole. While well, you can see the stuff coming in and out of individual physical interfaces, and there's no good reason why well, that physical interface is, is special compared to the bridge interface. <laughs> so, um, if you faithfully follow the IEEE model of 802.1q, you will have all of every one of those interfaces. They have a tap device for each one so that you can direct packets over this physical interface specifically or over the bridge interface and then they have clauses on how to handle it all. So I'm just saying, if you follow the spec, you would have, you would have all of these things. It's a bit of work, but. And it's there, so that's not. So I mean, not we can a lot of hardware problems. can support it too because they, a lot of the hardware is built off of the, the 802.1q spec. Yes. So, yeah, just to, to clarify, this, so there is a big difference if you inject a packet on, at the bridge device or one of the linked devices. It, it are being sent out forwarded to the layer two domain represented by the bridge, while in the other case, it will send out on the specific link. So, so we, at least, uh, treat it differently, and I would assume others do the same. Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe it could be done in a more elegant way, but at least that is the way we have, and, and to me, it, it seems to work well. Um, all right. So the other uh, natural change that would go along and if, if you implement this is that a uh, lesser frame will go to the CPU, which is pretty much what, what we wanted to achieve. And then you kind of have the task that you need to, to get your statistics right. You, you still had to do this because it was only the RX pass that goes to the CPU and, and, and the packet was marked that they needed to um, edit. It, the bridge shouldn't forward it because it has already been forwarded by hardware. So before, the statistics was not 100% correct, at least in, in, in all situations, and, and they still are not. Uh, but we are doing the best we can to get them as close as possible. But statistics are surprisingly hard when, when having um, both software and, and hardware doing something, and, and, and yeah, not always 100% right, but, but good enough to be useful. And notice, uh, the um, all multi is still set, meaning that all multicast packets will go to the CPU in, in other cases. So, next optimization that, that is very common um, is that in, in many cases, these networks have certain VLANs that are carrying a high amount of, of uh, multicast or even broadcast traffic, and it can make a, dif it can make a big difference to be able to, to um, protect the CPU from receiving this traffic. So, so typically what we want are seeing is that, that in the use cases we are operating in, it's desirable to be able to explicitly configure what VLANs do you actually want to connect your CPU awareness to. Um, so this can actually be configured very easily today. So, so in, in the example below, we, we can add uh, our two port devices. So I'm, I'm using P0 and E0, a bit interchangeable, but, but it is still great. Um, so you can add them to one VLAN, and then you can only add your front ports to another VLAN. And then the bridge will be flooding traffic, uh, including the CPU, in broadcast multicast traffic if it is on VLAN 100, and it will not do it if it's on VLAN 200. So 
This can easily be implemented. I'm not sure this is how it was supposed to be used because at least my reading of the other driver it does not seem like, like that is how they are doing it. Um, so the consequences of changing this is we, need, we don't need to do any changes in, in the bridge implementation. All the hooks and handles are there and, and they work nicely together. We cannot support thorough interfaces on this because it kind of assumes that, that if you have a VLAN where the CPU is not a member of, it will not see the packages, not even the broadcast multicast packages, so the CPU cannot give that additional interface a copy. So that's very unfortunate. Um, we have other use cases where we cannot support the thermal interfaces, so we need to disable it anyway. So, so in the world of, of the drive I'm working on, we, we will prevent this from happening because, um, yeah, I cannot remember. There is a, a list of other um, problems that, that, that we are seeing with the thermal interfaces, so we need to prevent it using the hooks that is already there. So it would be nice if it could, but, but naturally it cannot. Um, we kind of want to, to do this because it makes a bit difference. So, so this is actually real use cases. There are often these VLANs that is used to carry high bandwidth traffic. Consider video streams and so on. If, if, if the CPU is, is there to handle a contact or an LED or something, you, you don't want it to receive all the video traffic that may be carried. So, so, so even though it, it may be a bit strange that we have a software bridge and, and we are not allowing it to see all the packages, we are not allowing it to, to be in the flooding domain, I think it's a compromise worth taking. And, and again, it works nicely with what we have already. Um, the only uh, thing that, that is um, not so nice is that, that when someone adds a sub-interface to, for instance, the BR0, they want to add a VLAN interface 100. So, so then you need to add VLAN 100 to the bridge. Um, we're trying to see if we have the correct notifications in order to do this, but there are some cases where, where it, it's not working well. So we need we're not convinced we need a, a, a change in the, in the core system in order to support it. Hopefully we can, we can do it with the hooks and handles that is already there, but, but it's something that would be nice. But to me, it's kind of a nice to have. Uh, you, it's not unreasonable for the users to, to understand that they need to add the CPU to the VLANs where they have sub-interfaces. But it would be very nice if it wasn't needed because why should it be needed? Yeah. Any questions? Nice. So the next optimization is um, to add some hooks and handles in order to limit the flooding of non-layer three multicast frames. So today, in the kernel, there's a lot of features in order to, to there is this IDMP, which can automatically inspect what host is interested in receiving certain multicast layer three frames. You can also add uh, static entries of layer three frame of layer three frames. But it's all limited to the, to the group of uh, multicast MAC addresses that is used by either IPv4 or IPv6. So there's no way in, in existing uh, kernels where we can add um, a static group for something like 01, 000, blah, 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 and number four. And, and, and these uh, layer two um, MAC addresses happen to be used quite a lot in these networks. For instance, they are, they are the test and the beacon frames sent out by DLR and MRP. And some of these protocols want to send out such a frame every 10 microsecond. That, that's a lot of frames. And, and if we don't do any changes, so we could apply the VLAN stuff I just mentioned earlier. Um, but otherwise, if we don't do any changes, all these frames will go to the CPU. And, and what is worse is that, that many of these ring protection standards is actually explicitly saying if you are switched and you don't implement these standards, then at least limit the flooding to the two ports where they belong, because otherwise you will mess up other instantiation of this. So, so that's um, something that is at least needed if, if we want to have uh, an unaware uh, behavior of, of these protocols, and we need to limit it. So we did a, a bunch of iterations of these patches, and, and, and we got some very good comments and then feedback on it and, 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 and the patches are much more mature now and, and I actually think they will have a, a decent chance to be accepted in, in a revision or two later. So right now we have it in, in our internal repositories, we, we are testing with it and, and we want to start developing the use cases of DLR and MRP internally, see if it actually 
fully solve our problems so that we don't upstream a bunch of stuff that wasn't really needed anyway. So it's not because we have forgotten about it, it's just because we, we got the, the feedback we need very much and, and, and right now we have it for testing and, 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 uh, yeah, and, and we have an issue with the show commands that we also need to, to have addressed in order to, to have something we want to propose as, as an next revision. Um, but this is, yeah, it's small optimization, but, but, but it, it means a lot if you happen to have these use cases. So, so this is the final one of, um, of these optimization <coughs> I have prepared. Um, and I need to say, this is also the one I'm least <coughs> optimistic about, uh, because the, the payback you will get if you have everything else applied so far is getting less and less and less. But it's, it's, I added it more in order to complete the, the analysis. So, so this is the final change we need if we want to have equivalent performance with, with what we do in existing use cases. So I'll get to it. In the same way as bridges today put interfaces into promiscuous mode, they, always, they also set the all multi, uh, which means that an interface is supposed to receive all the multicast addresses seen at the network. So it's not using the, the MC list in, in the netdev, um, it just copies all multicast frames to the CPU. And, and that solves a lot of problems because then you don't stand in the CPU and, and it's missing a frame, you're supposedly to have everything there. Um, it is something that, again, it, 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 it's something that normal NICs don't need to do because if, when they are not operating as a bridge because in that case, the bridge is all the different software components is able to tell I want this multicast address, I need it for this purpose. It will get registers and then eventually the driver will call the RX mode and, and, and it can set up hardware filters and only copy these multicast frames that is very much needed to the CPU. And if we are in a world where we, sorry, if we are in a world where we do not have threatened interfaces, we should actually be able to foresee what frames do we need in the CPU instead of relying on just getting everything there. Naturally, this is an optimization which only can be applied if you don't have any front end interfaces. So if, if we wanted to do this, uh, we need to, to revert these optimization if you add a front end interface in order to keep that use case running. So it's, it will be harder to do for sure. Uh, and, and maybe it makes sense for, for drivers like, like ours that are not supporting foreign interfaces anyway, but, but then we need to add some uh, more events into the kernel in order to get the right set of notifications there. Um, but anyway, let's assume that we want to do this. I um, will not promise you that we will get to it, but, but let's assume we want to do it. Let's have a look at what actually needs to be changed in order to, to get this working. So, so the first, um, obvious thing is that, that the bridge dev set multicast list, which is called in, in the RX mode set, is an empty function. So naturally we need, we need something to go there because we need to be able to tell whatever driver is implementing this and now we have a new multicast that someone wants to listen at. So today we just throw away that information. We are not keeping it anywhere. Uh, no, the information is there, but, but the notification is not being implemented correctly. Um, we tried to actually implement this just to play around with it and, and get a feeling about how much, how many, many other issues are we seeing. And the next issue we were seeing is that, yeah, most of these uh, in MAC addresses, uh, multicast MAC addresses that, that we are interested in seeing is actually coming from the sub interfaces. So they are coming from VLAN interfaces under the BR0 because what we typically use a bridge to is that we want not to connect to a physical wire, we want to connect to a layer two broadcast domain. And that there are two broadcast domain in VLAN aware switches is typically represented by a VLAN. And, and that was kind of the next issue where we saw that um, when you have a VLAN interface, it, it nicely implements the, the RX mode set, but it erases all the VLAN information that it kind of needs to have. So if, if we wanted to do a good job in implementing the RX mode set in the bridge device, we need to have a way to get the VLAN information from the sub-interfaces, because otherwise we wouldn't know what VLAN would you be interested in. Then we could actually end up in a situation where we'll be getting more traffic to the CPU than, than what we wanted, and, and that was kind of not where we wanted to go. So that also needed to be said. Uh, we, we fixed that with an ugly hack. We just extended the, um, 
the multicast list such that the VLAN interface could add useful information and everybody else at a zero. Just wanted to play around with it. And then we came to some other issues in the IDMP world that we never got to the bottom of, which is why I'm saying I'm not sure we will get to the bottom of this. At least it, it, it requires significant more effort to do so. Luckily, this is also what we see as the least important issue because we believe that we can actually uh, get to a point that is good enough if, if we apply the series of other optimizations. But this is pretty much uh, the, the bonds of, of work we see that is needed if we want to get to exactly the same amount of frames copied to the CPUs in these two cases. Um, another funny observation is that after I, I, I did this presentation, I realized it had nothing to do with hardware. So everything I said could actually be applied to, to the configuration up here where we are having an existing switch. So, so it, it, it doesn't matter if, if the hardware is different. Pretty much all these optimizations will make sense in the same context and could be useful. I was just having to be focusing on that the hardware I was working on. Um, So this is the list of optimizations that I wanted to talk about. The, the final slide I have is um, just mentioning so some of the next steps that we haven't done any experiments on yet and, 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 and we don't know exactly how it goes. So if you have questions on, for this, I think we should take it first. Otherwise, I will explain you what are the next uh, steps in our agenda. I'll run. You can ask later if you come up with something, of course. So um, if you look at the main page of, of the IP link and, and the implementation, there are a nice, oh, there is a huge amount of flags that can be uh, set to, to the bridge slaves um, in order to do all kind of interesting stuff. So you can enable disable flooding, you can enable disable flooding for multicast frames, you can ask it to do learning, not do learning, you can do FTB plus and, and all kind of stuff. And all of these properties is on, at the complete bridge domain. None of these operates at the VLAN domain. And we need a lot of this, but on a VLAN domain. So we would be very interesting in, in working at trying to, to support many of these um, flags, tuning, whatever we call it, to be able to apply only to a certain port comma VLAN or just a VLAN. Um, I'm not, I haven't followed the development of this long enough to actually have seen what were the motivations to let it go in here, but, but, but in, in, in the world I'm coming from, everything is per VLAN. So, so, so we were a bit surprised to see that, that it's not. And, and the other thing that, that, that would be really interesting to do is to, to have at least such that you can set the state in a, in a port comma VLAN mode, because then you, at least you could enable the existing user space implementation of MSTP or, or maybe uh, do a kernel implementation of MSTP. Um, so this is this are some shortcomings that 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 we are very interesting to to work on in order to to support um, more of the use cases that, that we are seeing. Um, another effort that that have slowly started is to to do a kernel level uh, purely software based implementation of of DLR or MRP. Um, as an alternative to STP or at least a supplement. Um, as I explained earlier, so, so this is some really common um, ring protocols that is used in this time of networks and, 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 and they are important to us. Therefore, we would be very interested in, in working on, on adding those to the upstream kernel. Um, we have started working on it and, and hopefully in, in, I don't know, some time I will not put any quantities on it. It depends on how things go. We will probably do some Git repository or something where we, where we can show people what we're doing. It will take a long time until this hits states where we want to, to even try submit it, but, but we would very much like to, to give pe people an opportunity to see what are the direction we're going in, and, and with a bit of luck, we will uh, get avoid some of the stupidest mistakes that we could, could do. So, so, so there's, this is our intent to do. And naturally, when, when we get to a point where, where we have a good implementation of the software. It's, it's some features that is extremely easy to offload in hardware because what these protocols do is they send out a test frame they, every whatever microsecond and they see if they receive it. 
and, and lots of hardware can actually generate these test frames on their own, and then they can uh, raise and interrupt if, if, if uh, the receiver detects that now a certain amount of time have passed and I have not seen two in a row or something. Um, and, and that is kind of uh, how these protocols are working. And there's a lot of details and, and, and weird uh, state machines running that, that needs to be addressed. So it's not like it's a simple implementation, but, but the overall concept is pretty simple to understand. Uh, yeah, and the MSTP I, I spoke about already. That's what I prepared for you. Any questions? Any questions? Let's switch to offloads. I'm getting better. Um, I have a question. When you are talking about protocol, what about other protocol like uh, LLDP offload? Because we have some ports now, and the LLDP should sh terminate at that port. Or uh, link layer discovery protocol. Yeah. So, so I think it's too low bandwidth to be worth it. To be honest, so. I, I, it's a long time since I, I looked at, at LLDP, no, but it's something that running pretty much once a second. So and yeah, it should be around every half a second or a second. So you are talking here only about protocol which will uh, add some performance by offloading them? Yeah, so, so, hmm. yeah. so, so the main motivation in order to do kernel-based protocols is that there's no, user space will have a hard time doing the same. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the first criteria. I, I don't want to do a kernel-based implementation of LLDP. It will be a nightmare in order to add a new TLV every time someone wants to do it. And user space can probably do just as good a job because it, it needs to inject a frame every, I cannot remember, let's say every something between 100 millisecond and second. And, and we, even with, with the slow CPUs that I'm working on, I, I, I don't think I will, I will see any real benefit in it. The, the, the reason why we are seeing it in, in MRP and DLR is that I think the, the goal is to do f complete failover in, in, in less than a millisecond. And, and in order to do this, you need to, to inject your test frames in, in, in something like 100 microseconds intervals. And, and that's, that's a lot. And, and, and then consider if you want to do a slightly bigger switch where you're serving maybe, maybe you're serving 24 rings in, in a 48 ported switch then it's time 24, the amount of packages you need to inject, and then it really starts to matter. So, so this is pretty much where we, we see the effort. Another place where you could apply this optimization, which we are doing in, in um, so, so beside from doing a switch driver, we're also doing an MIT-based uh, library in order to enable our switches to VxWorks and other customers. And, and it also have a lot of facilities to do it for PTP sync frames, because if you happen to implement PTP in a switch, you need to sync out a lot of these sync frames. Um, and, and, and for that, we, we have hardware that can do offloads, but, but are not doing it. And the final place where, where at least we and Microchip are doing hardware offload is in the OEM world, where you are doing continuously monitoration on, at interfaces and, and you're doing hardware-based tests. And, and, and for that, we also have a lot of hardware. But, but this is for a different set of switches than this one. So, so the, the PTP is used here, but, but the OEM is not. Um, LLDP, I, I, th I think it's too much effort to gain too little. Any other questions? Hi, right, thank you, Alan, very much. Thank you.